tonight. The tax bill emerges, Maduro survives, and the all-American bad guy. I'm Big Daddy, man. I'm gonna get another doll. At least four Palestinians were killed by Israeli troops, and more than 100 were injured, in the latest protests over President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. After Friday prayers, crowds of thousands in the West Bank and Gaza set fire to tires and threw rocks at Israeli soldiers, who responded with tear gas and live fire. The Israeli military said troops fired selectively. Jada Franson, the deputy leader of a far-right group in the UK, has been released on bail after being charged with threatening behavior. Franson became the center of an international uproar this month when President Trump retweeted her anti-Islamic posts. This week, she's been in Belfast, where she was arrested after allegedly urging people to take action against Islamic ideology in an online video. Franson said her arrest was a blatant attempt to prevent free speech. Penn State officials showed a, quote, shocking apathy to the dangers of excessive drinking, according to a grand jury report released today. The report into hazing and alcohol consumption was commissioned after a 19-year-old died in February when pledging the Beta Theta Pi fraternity. Tim Piazza's fraternity brothers allegedly gave him 18 drinks in 82 minutes, and 26 of the men are facing charges. The report calls on Penn State to regulate drinking on campus, rather than leave that task to a fraternity council. It's already taken lives. They cannot understand what people are waiting on to make these changes. The school permanently banned Beta Theta Pi in March. In a statement today, Penn State's president said the school strongly disagrees with many characterizations in the report, but that it will review the findings and is committed to improving student safety and well-being. A federal judge has issued a temporary block on President Trump's rollback of a requirement that employers cover contraception at no cost. In October, the Trump administration created broad exemptions for employers who objected to the Obama-era insurance mandate. The judge said it was hard to comprehend a rule that, quote, intrudes more into the lives of women. The House Ethics Committee has launched an investigation into Representative Reuben Kiwin, a Nevada Democrat, after accusations of sexual harassment by two women. Earlier this month, BuzzFeed reported allegations by a staffer that he repeatedly harassed her and made sexual advances during the 2016 campaign. Kiwin responded that he didn't recall doing what she described. Then a second woman came forward this week, saying Kiwin harassed her when he was a state senator. And yesterday, he issued a statement that he's dated several women during his time in office and that, quote, out of respect for their privacy, I won't discuss my communications or any other details of those relationships. He has rejected calls from other Democrats to resign. It's been a dominant pattern in Washington this year that the new president and his Republican majorities couldn't come together to get anything done. The motion is not agreed to. But with just two weeks left in the year, it looks like the GOP might finally be able to get out of its own way and pass a tax reform bill. I think that we are going to be in a position to pass something as early as next week, which will be monumental. Late today, Republican Senators Marco Rubio and Bob Corker say they're now willing to vote yes on a compromise version of the bill, which was released this afternoon, putting one of Trump's biggest goals within reach. All he'll have to do now is convince the country that the new law is as good as he says. Now that we finally know what this thing looks like, how does it stack up to the promises about a tax bill Trump has made along the way? The president said he'd get the tax bill passed by the end of the year. We fired up the old supercomputer down in the research department and calculated that it is in fact still 2017 and this bill is expected to pass before January. So that's a promise kept. Here's another promise. I'm lowering taxes actually because I think it's so important for corporations. The original plan in the draft legislation was to cut the corporate tax rate from 35% to 20%. But after thinking about it, Republicans decided that was too drastic of a cut and could cause big problems with the deficit. So they adjusted the rate back up. 
all the way from 20% to 21%. I am proposing an across the board income tax reduction, especially for middle income Americans. Big tax cuts for everyone. Your taxes go down, my taxes go down, everyone's taxes go down. That was the promise. Lily Batchelder is a tax lawyer and policy expert at NYU. Full disclosure, she used to work as an economic policy advisor to the Obama administration. It's pretty clear that it's going to result in small tax cuts on average for the middle class turning into reasonably meaningful tax increases over time for the middle class. One of Trump's most long-standing promises is his pledge to repeal the Johnson Amendment, a rule that says tax-exempt churches and other charities can't directly advocate or raise money for a political candidate. All religious leaders should be able to freely express their thoughts and feelings on religious matters. White evangelical leaders really wanted this, but it got cut from the final bill. Promise broken. Over the next 10 years, our economic team estimates that under our plan, the economy will average 3.5% growth and create a total of 25 million new jobs. This is being sold as literally the entire point of the tax bill. Republicans and the president say all these major changes to the tax code and tax rates and everything else will create a booming economic growth that will allow everyone to prosper, including the middle class. Judging that promise right out of the gate is hard to do. Even for Paul Ryan, the bill's godfather, he got asked by NPR if he was sure the tax plan was gonna grow the economy. I'm not gonna tell you, I'm sure. How can a person say such a thing? I can't say that. So Ryan says, we'll have to wait and see. Dr. Batchelder says, no, we don't. We can tell people broadly that if you're in the middle class, this is not a good deal for you, and ultimately you're gonna see your tax bill go up as a result. Today, the government moved to dismiss the first multi-plaintiff lawsuit of its kind. Eleven people are suing the Department of Homeland Security over searches they were subjected to when they tried to re-enter the United States from abroad. They're represented by the ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and they say the government violated their First and Fourth Amendment rights when it demanded access to their smartphones and computers. I was returning from filming in Canada in January 2017, when border agents detained me for nearly two hours and demanded all sorts of information from me, including my phone's passcode, my social media handles, uh, my email address. And I feared that refusing their demands would result in them holding me at the border indefinitely. Of the 11 plaintiffs, 10 are American citizens and one is a legal permanent resident. They include two journalists, a former U.S. Air Force captain, and a NASA engineer. Four had their devices confiscated for weeks, but none of them were ever charged with any wrongdoing. The Fourth Amendment protects people against unreasonable searches and seizures, but Congress and the courts have long given the government more latitude to perform searches when it comes to U.S. borders. Things that would come in over a land border would tend to be the kinds of things that you could carry on your horse's back, in your saddlebag. Today, when we cross the border, we're carrying all kinds of information that is personal to us and available through our digital devices like cell phones and laptop computers. The searches at the border have fundamentally changed as technology has evolved. During the 2015 fiscal year, Customs and Border Protection agents searched the devices of 8,500 travelers. That number more than doubled in 2016. DHS acknowledged the increase, but argued electronic media searches still only accounted for, quote, less than one hundredth of one percent of travelers arriving to the United States. Searching electronic devices without a warrant at border crossings became DHS policy in 2009. And since then, the government has argued, quote, no court has concluded that such searches require a warrant, and our use of this authority has been repeatedly upheld. But in 2014, in the case of Riley versus California, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled police officers must first obtain a warrant before they can search the phones of anyone they arrest. The ACLU says that ruling should also apply to border agents. The Supreme Court in Riley said no. 
that cell phones were different because of the amount of data that they hold, and therefore search incident to a lawful arrest exception doesn't entitle one to search the cell phone. In its response today, DHS reiterated its argument that courts have already rejected claims that Border Patrol agents need probable cause or a warrant to search and seize electronic devices. The 11 plaintiffs will have until January 26 to respond in court. After a roller coaster year of political upheaval and financial instability in Venezuela, leaders of the country's ruling party and its opposition gathered today in the Dominican Republic. It's the second meeting aimed at fostering a peaceful dialogue between rivals. What's clear, though, is that one man is still very much in charge, Nicolas Maduro. It might have seemed improbable at one point that Maduro would hang on to the presidency. Instead, he's managed to further tighten his grip on power. David Noriega explains how he's pulled it off. For three months, starting in April, people filled the streets of Caracas and other Venezuelan cities nearly every single day to protest rising insecurity and a crumbling economy. Today, the picture in Caracas is different. The protests died down late in the summer, and they fell far short of toppling the government of Nicolás Maduro. In fact, his grip on power has only tightened. The ruling United Socialist Party of Venezuela now controls every branch of government. By arresting, exiling, and otherwise marginalizing his rivals, and by creating a new legislative body stacked with his supporters, Maduro has cut the legs off the opposition. But in many ways, the opposition has made that easy for him. They can't agree on anything, including whether to participate aggressively in elections or reject them altogether. That explains how, last week, Maduro's party swept municipal elections across the country, consolidating its power even further. The opposition boycotted those elections almost completely. In the Libertador district of Caracas, the new mayor-elect from the ruling party, Erika Farias, barely faced a challenge from the organized opposition. <laughs> Heading into the election last week, Faria saw a bright future. This hardly describes the reality of the poor and working Venezuelans who typically support the ruling party. Inflation has made basic goods unaffordable, and food shortages are causing many to go hungry. And for those who spent months trying to topple the government in the streets, that grim reality is compounded by political disillusionment. Manuel Melo, a 21-year-old graphic design student, was one of them. On May 22nd, amid critical shortages of drugs and medical supplies, Venezuelan doctors marched in Caracas, and Melo joined them. He was struck in the side by a fire hose. The next day, he lost a kidney. Fue un golpe que me quitó los pies del, del piso, y hizo que diera una vuelta canela y cayera, casi que arrodillado, con el escudo en el piso, y intentó levantarme, of success was to become a 747 pilot. This weekend will mark the end of an era for American aviation. 
It will be the last time a Boeing 747 passenger plane will take off from the United States. The Queen of the Skies, as she was known, flew its first passengers in January 1970, ushering in a golden age of glamour and accessibility in air travel. With four engines instead of two, and two aisles instead of one, the jumbo jet made other planes look smaller. It made the world seem smaller because it could fly faster and farther than its predecessors. But the thing most people remember, including 747 pilot David Smith, whose father also flew 747s, was the spiral staircase. My mother would dress us in suits and ties. The upstairs area, or the hump behind the cockpit, was dedicated to lavishness. So you had lounges, cocktail bars, all sorts of fancy things. Captain Smith piloted United Airlines' last domestic 747 flight in November, and he still vividly remembers his first time flying the iconic jet. The first time was indeed uh, <laughs> A humbling experience. It is so different than anything else that I have flown up to this point in time. It's such an honest, straightforward, well-engineered flying marvel. There's this cushion of air you land on. And with those 18 wheels out there and the well-engineered aspects of that airplane, it tends to land smoother. The 747 wound up being more successful than anyone ever imagined. It's carried three and a half billion passengers, U.S. presidents, and space shuttles. But the things that brought the 747 into existence, demand for more revenue and better technology, are the same things now forcing it into retirement. For Captain Smith, his favorite memory will be one of the final 747 flights he piloted earlier this year, with his 90-year-old father in the jump seat. We flew from Chicago to Denver to let him sit there and enjoy the tool that helped to bring aviation to the masses in this country. Star Wars The Force Awakens is the highest grossing film ever in a single market. And which one comes in second? Wolf Warrior. That'd be China's Wolf Warrior 2, which made an astonishing $850 million this year and had its DVD released this week. Wolf Warrior 2 is the story of a retired Chinese Special Forces soldier who goes to Africa to rescue Africans and fellow Chinese citizens from his toughest enemy yet, an evil American man named Big Daddy, played by Frank Grillo. Dexter Thomas talked to Grillo about what it means to be the biggest punching bag in Chinese film history. Frank Grillo turned 52 this year. He's a pretty normal guy. He's got a wife, kids, and he likes to go to the gym. It's just that his day job is to get hit. Fighters all want to be actors, and actors all want to be fighters. And you're both. I kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Before Wolf Warrior, Grillo starred as Crossbones in Captain America. He took the role to play Big Daddy, even though he'd never seen a Chinese movie before. I think for a lot of people, I mean, definitely for people in China, Wolf Warrior is your breakout film. Oh my God, yeah. I mean, they know me from Captain America as yeah. Crossbones. Let me just get this really fast. I don't know if you want to see that. <laughs> That's me, whatever. It's you have a, a toy deal. of yeah. yourself. <laughs> anyway, so they wanted me. They, they called and they made a very nice offer were you just confused the whole time? The whole, I mean, I walked through the world confused as it is, <laughs> but I was really confused in China. And, uh, but Wu Jing, the guy who wrote, directed, and starred in the film, who is now bigger than Jackie Chan, he kind of walked me through everything and, and we had some fun together. And then I went home. In just over a month, the movie had already made $800 million. Outside of China though, that success raised some eyebrows. Reviewers called the movie propaganda. Wolf Warrior 2 shows China as a liberating force in Africa. There's a lot of flag waving, and in the final scene, the Chinese hero beats up the white American guy. Do you remember your last line in the film? You're about to stab him, and you say, people like you. Right. People like you will always be theory, people like me. You know that's not what it says in Chinese, right? No. So what it says in the subtitles 
is in this world, there are the weak and the strong, and your race will always be the weak. Right. The Chinese audience is seeing this white American dude telling a Chinese person, you are the weak, weak. race, right. we are the strong race. Right. And then Wu Jin and then, comes and up then, and kills the dude right. and says, and then, and then, that's and then, history. And then people cheer, I'm sure. Talk about registering with the zeitgeist in China. I mean, this guy, like, I was laughing at a lot of things he was doing. I said, this is, this movie's ridiculous. This, some of this is ridiculous. You're thinking like an American. I'm thinking, this doesn't, this will never translate, it'll never work, it's just made $900 million. It is interesting. We don't think of Rambo as a propaganda movie. It's exactly what it is. It's like the great Americans always there to save the world from disaster. Those are propaganda movies. They're fun, they're good, I mean, you know, but, that's propaganda. And now you are yeah. that evil dude. I'm Big Daddy, man. I'm gonna get another doll. That's Vice News Tonight for Friday, December 15th, 